How's it going, everyone? This is Josh. Welcome back. I'm starting a series of artist interviews, and to open that up, I have today Daniel Neshi. Goes just musically as Neshi. Do I have that right? Yep, you got that right. Okay, all right. Neshi here is an Australian-born instrumentalist, producer, songwriter, and mix engineer. Just does a whole heckin' lot of stuff, but you mentioned that your love just runs deep into creation, uh, I have to tell you that I listened to your project, uh, Miura, I think it is. I think I got that. Um, mm-hmm. And it's great. I love the whole, uh, you know, uh, instrumental led. Um, I'm into it. So it sounds great. At what point did you know that you had like a skill set, like a talent for this and decide to cultivate that, develop that? Well, it's funny um, that you mentioned that project because that was like the start of everything. Um, that that project was something that I started with my bandmate at the time um, when I was when I was fifteen. Yeah. So that that I think the the start of everything was basically when I was in high school, being playing with other players and and being like, oh wow, okay, like it's it's enjoyable to play with other people. Um, that that project, my aura, was really the start of everything. And my bandmate and I, at the time, I've since left all the bands, but that was really the that was really the point on which I started to realize maybe maybe I could take this further. Um, but I appreciate you giving it a listen. That music's all quite old now, but um, <laughs> it was it was it was good times, and it was a, it was a pivotal starting moment for me. That's really cool. And I mean, you mentioned that it was kind of the starting point you realize it felt good to play with other people and you've kind of made a career out of it i mean we did a we did i sent you a pre-interview and you listed a long list of people and it's not just you know random names these are some pretty heavy hitters one that i could throw off since we're talking about myora uh rohan stevenson who uh i built the sky who was actually on a project for myora if i understand that correctly he was listed in the credits yeah, he did a guest solo row. Um, Rose here in Melbourne. He's a really nice guy. Um, just just hitting him up. Um, I built this guy's a really cool project. Everyone should go listen to him. He's always dropping stuff so so regularly. It's great. Um, but no, he he guest soloed on the track, which is which is really fun to have him on. He did a really good job as well. How does stuff like that come about? You said you started with Mayura at fifteen. So how does it go from that to someone like I Built the Sky featuring on a project when you, with a project that you started at 15? Um, I don't know. I think, I don't feel like that stuff is that hard when, when you're making connections in music, when you're, when you're making people your friends or when you're making people your professional peers. I don't feel like it's too big of an ask if you're willing to just work within, you know, work within reason. Like people have rates, people have timelines. Yeah. It, it's not it's not too hard. I mean, even since leaving all the bands and now working with a whole new set of people and getting new features on, on new music I'm working on, the principles are still the same. I mean, the worst someone can say is no. And I just remember messaging, like asking my bandmate, being like, what do you think? Should we get him on? <laughs> Be like, yeah, let, let's try it. And and messaging him and, and yeah, just working within, you know, the budget, the timeline and getting that all sorted. It's, it's actually not that complicated. I think people put a lot of emphasis on being like, oh, I shouldn't message him or them or her because you know, they're, they're doing so much and I'm at this point and they're at that point. But if you just ask, you're not going to lose anything. That's really cool. I think that's, if nothing else, I think that's a show of bravery because I could definitely see, like you said, that people put too much onto, no, I shouldn't ask him that stuff. Has, is talking to people just easy for you? Have you always had that make them say no mentality, I guess? I mean, I wouldn't say it's always been easy, but I think as I started to do more music stuff, I started to realize that you're not actually going to get anything if you don't really ask for it, if you don't really like push for it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've i had non-music jobs. I do non-music stuff as well outside, you know, and a lot of that is a lot more straightforward in the sense of you you don't need to ask for stuff because stuff needs to get done. Whereas in music, no one's no one's pushing you along this industry is a lot of creating your own jobs, creating your own roles, um, pushing yourself to be on different projects. And if, if you're not asking, if you're not 
if you're not borderline harassing in a sense to to push yourself in the right positions, it's you're probably not doing everything right. That's a good perspective. I mean, that's definitely something that would carry you, I think, through the through the industry. Have you, I guess, since then, since you decided that you wanted to keep pursuing music, are you doing this full time? Is like that's what music is to you? I am. I'm transitioning patiently. I'm not. Um, I'm not rushing into full time. All of my work fits within uh, the digital scope. I do okay. work around here in Sydney in digital production um, within and outside of music. Um, but I mean, if you look at all the projects I've got on at the moment musically, it's definitely like a lot of a lot of work. So every day there is definitely something to do. But I but I'm being patient. Um, I'm not forcing anything. I'm not trying to push myself into a position that I'm not ready for. There's still a lot to learn. There's a lot of people to meet, a lot of traveling still to do. Um, So I'm taking it one step at a time and a lot of great and interesting projects keep coming my way. So the progress is being made. So I'm not, uh, I'm not rushing anything and I'm, I'm not unsatisfied with anything. I think since you started your projects really early, like I think 15, you can kind of objectively say it's pretty early in the music process. What would you say it have kind of already been some of your highlights and lowlights that kind of don't make, you know, the the Instagram reel? They don't make the the highlight reel that people are going to see, uh, you know, when you do end up making the transition to music full time. What are some of the things that people won't see that have been highlights and lowlights? Mm, that's a really good question. I think um, highlights that people won't see is definitely certain moments of practice paying off All like right. in in terms of in terms of actual practice um i mean one of one of the big things that i've had a humongous emphasis on um in the last in the last year has been um networking and has been on on my vocal capacity right. and and going from i i had a i have a really tight larynx All um right. And it has not been fun. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't post anything relating to my instrumentation practice or, or my practice methods in general. But going from uh, not even one octave to nearly two within the last year has been like a really big thing for my vocal coach and I. I mean, those those kinds of things are the things that people aren't going to see. They're not going to see the years of dedication or the years of practice to an instrument. I've been playing guitar for. I don't know, 13 something years. I think it's about that. Yeah. Um, Like people obviously aren't going to see the practice. They'll see the result and like their point of view will start from the result. Like if there's a, if there is a point in my career where all of a sudden something clicks and a whole bunch of people know who I am, that's their starting point. They're seeing from that. They won't see anything before that. Maybe they'll do a deep dive, but that'll be about it. Um, And in terms of like, bad moments that people won't see i guess for me leaving the bands was was a very very tough decision that was that was very hard to do i mean my close friends saw how divided i was about that um and i guess you know sometimes people you know people won't see projects that you really wanted to be on that you know never eventuated because obviously you you weren't on them Right. <laughs> that that does have to hurt. I think I don't think I've ever really fully thought about the implications of leaving a project when you really wanted it to work. I've had that happen, but I don't think I ever go back and sit on that. And that's oh, that comes out as painful. Uh, speaking on the early part of your career, you in the pre-interview mentioned you used to work at a label. With that sort of background, what do you think is the best piece of advice you give that is never heard of or talked about in the space? Like, you know, like people with influencers passing knowledge around back and forth. What's like the best piece of knowledge that you see being passed around and kind of the worst that you see being passed around? Mm, yeah. So to, to add on that, I actually still do digital production for the label. That's kind of like one of the things I do outside of it, actually right. being a musician. So I still still prep releases um, for, for the label here here in Sydney. Um, that's a good question. I think um, any piece of advice relating to punctuality 
like oh, it's music you're never going to stick to the timetable perfectly but any piece of advice relating to communication open communication and punctuality in terms of supplying your masters right really cracking down on getting your artwork done cracking down on like if you want to put together a press release don't do it last minute you know yeah. do it when do it when the mixes are done not five minutes, you know, before you've got to send everything out, like really get on top of stuff as early as you can, right? but not too early where it would have been better if you waited. I think like any advice relating to that is always, is always very positive. Um, I don't know. Worst, worst advice. There's a, there's a lot of bad advice out there. (laughs) I feel that way. Anytime I come across. So I started off as a guitar. um, I started off on guitar and kind of moved to play instrumental, but having a somewhat of a formal background, I actually do cringe when I see influencers really at all. And it could be perfectly fine advice, but I think I'm just a little bit jaded, even just the very beginning. I'm a little jaded to any information that comes across my when I'm scrolling or something like that. Yeah, actually, like, I I think the, the things that make me the most, like, cringe and the most the most jaded is anytime, anytime I just see people commenting on other people's posts needlessly negatively, like, just, oh, yeah. like, especially for young players or new players or people who are just starting to write music, um, anyone who, like, sits there and be like, oh, you have to know this theory and this theory and that theory. And it's like, well, not everyone needs to know that and not yeah. everyone wants to know that. Some people, some of the best musicians I know will hardly ever talk about theory. You know, so many of them are, are not formally trained, like, in a tertiary setting either. So I think ignore advice that goes against what makes you love creating. I think like that's a very baseline, like, yeah, just ignore anything that makes you deter from continuing. I think that's really good advice. I like that a lot. So I was looking at your social medias and there's kind of different content across them. TikTok, Mm. you have a lot of educational material along with reactions and stuff. And I really liked your breakdowns on TikTok and stuff. And your Instagram is a lot of, travel is that just kind of you kind did you set that intentionally or is that just kind of it just kind of turned out that way because of the platform no i i definitely set that out intentionally um i i thought about it too because tiktok's a very you know re- like respectively it's a new space yeah meaning that everything you know we think about and work at you know it's a new space like i wouldn't say i've i've particularly put you know a lot of effort into that more like I'm a very big analytics analytics person. So posting something, looking at it a week later, posting something else, looking at that a week later and like measuring <laughs> against each other is like, is a big deal for me. But no, I thought with TikTok being so short form, people wanting short attention spans and that kind of content, you know, the way it's set up, you're, you're scrolling through the feed. I thought, okay, let's make, let's make something, you know, let's make breakdowns. Let's make very quick, like, I think- like the breakdowns did really well. Even just like me, just putting my my phone on and just reacting to like a show I really liked or a song yeah. I really liked, just to play around with it. Whereas Instagram is definitely more a little formal. I have like companies that I work with that follow me on that, and I follow them. I have friends, I have family, and I have peers, and that's you know obviously I have more followers on that too. I've had Instagram long before I was doing music stuff. So I was like, okay, this is this is more of an insight into what's really going on. And I mean, if you look at my Instagram, it's not it's not flashy. It's just what's it's just what's happening. Whether that's traveling, whether it's a gear post, whether if you look at my stories and it's just you know me with my peers or me with my friends, it's it's just very honest. <laughs> that's really good. You say it's honest, but like the well, not not but uh, along with that, it actually. I'm really impressed that if if it is slice of life and a bit formal, the composition of the pictures is great. Do you have an eye for like photography and stuff too? Have you ever taken an interest in that? I don't think I have an eye for photography. I just like look at <laughs> I just look at that and I'm like, well, that looks nice. And That's I got really- my <laughs> well, I, I think I it have, comes out really well. 
I have um I have my little mirrorless camera that I take with me. Like when I went to Utah to 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 stay with a producer I knew there. Um, you know, being in a place like that, an environment like that, so different to where I'm from too. It's like you just look at everything and everything's breathtaking. And it's like, well, I've just got my camera in my hand the whole time. But no, I don't think I have an eye for photography. I actually think <laughs> like I'm I'm quite just like whatever at all that. But they seem to come out like decently well. So I'm just not going to question it. All right. I mean, I think that's as good an attitude as you could have about it. You said on your TikTok, or I guess just in general, you're an analytics person. Have you ever found yourself wrapped up in the numbers, like kind of consumed by the numbers? And ha- has that ever been detrimental to creation in general? Yeah, it has. There have been times where I've sat down and I'm like, I want to write a seven minute song, or <laughs> I want to write a song just in like, you know, some ridiculous time signature, like 26 over whatever i have a i have a song sitting somewhere that's got like a 26 over something time signature that i genuinely can't remember um (laughs) that i wrote in guitar pro yeah sometimes sometimes it it used to happen a lot more when i was younger being like i have to do something this way because i want to make it a challenge and i and i want to make it hard because i'm a very big competitor with myself and it's like i want to make it harder i want to make it new um and and yeah also sometimes looking at the numbers not just for myself, but sure. at other, you know, at other artists and and other producers, and definitely producers more. Like I look at producers playlists compared to other producers playlists, and kind of just like look at the numbers that way. Setting myself goals as well. Like I do have numerical goals. Yeah. Um, it's not the greatest way to look at things, but it's it's just it's <laughs> definitely the way my brain is built. So have you found that those can be deep? You- Obviously, those can be useful. Do you think they're useful to everybody? Would you say that numerical goals are useful for everybody? I think having numerical goals that can be achieved within your control are useful. So like a goal I have this year is to try and have 50 credits for the year. All right. So like that's that's something that's within my within my capacity to push and try and achieve. Like so far this year, like there'll be at least thinking off the top of my head, there's already at least 20 plus that I know are done or nearly done for this year. So I'll probably raise that number because we're so early in the year. But if I was to say a goal like, okay, I want, I don't know, 10 million streams, that's yeah. a little different because that's outside of my control. That's outside of my skill set and capacity to achieve that. So I think those are the kind of goals I've tried to weed out, but try to push more like, okay, I want to achieve this many credits this year, meaning I have to get on this many projects. So I think it's it's useful for some people. Okay. That's a good way to look at it. And I think that that actually really makes sense. There are certain things in your control and some that, you know, very reasonably aren't. Do you still get starstruck at all like i mean you you your youtube is covered in it your instagram is covered with you know projects you've been on on like pedals brands and stuff that you've worked with has there been any starstruck moments where someone approached you or you approached someone and them saying yes was just like a deer in the headlights moment i'm the worst person to ask this to because i i genuinely am like the most boring person ever in the <laughs> sense of like everyone's everyone's a human to me yeah like I still remember at Nam last year walking by and realizing it was Stevie Wonder playing and just being like, okay, cool. And just like watching and like not really minding too much. It was incredible. Sure. And it's like, I've got to see him play live in that moment. Um, I'm trying to think. I think when I was younger, having people say, I remember when Forrester Seville, who mixed the Carnivore albums, said yes to my bandmate and I to mix our EP. I was yeah. pretty hyped about that at the time. Um, I was pretty, I was pretty like Amity Affliction have already dropped a few songs from their new album. And I've gotten to do like choir vocals and like arrange my choir vocals. I sent I sent off maybe 50 stems all up for that, for the for the six tracks I was a part of on that. Um and they they've already released, they're already starting to release some. Um so I had to keep that pretty, I had to keep that like secret to myself for ages 
um being on that album was pretty cool because even though even though it's not like a humongous role like their orchestrator messaged me and messaged a few friends and stuff like that and he got a bunch of us to do stuff that was a pretty cool that was a pretty cool credit but i i wouldn't say starstruck Sure. Um, I think the moment the first piece of gear I got for free arrived was kind of like, oh, so we've stepped into this realm now. We've stepped into like this step. <laughs> Level that was kind of, of yeah. This it was definitely a, like a I've unlocked a skill tree moment <laughs> kind of here. Um, that that was a pretty cool moment to have gear arrive, unpackage it, having a Polaroid, looking at the invoice, and it's just zero across the board, being like oh. gear demo. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this feels different. <laughs> That's really cool. Who would you still like to work with? I imagine there's still like like numerous projects and stuff, but you mentioned everybody's a human to you. Who, at least the very top of the list, approached you, you would it, it would be that moment. I uh, I mean, if we're talking like really, really stupid, like yeah, I let's think- go for it. Really, really stupid, I think, either John Bellion, mm-hmm. uh, NF, or, or Ludwig Goranson. I think those three people would make me be – that That would, like, turn me into, like, a starstruck. Like, I don't think there's many people who could do it and yeah. maybe do a leap – and maybe do a leaper. Like, yeah. those four, like, because that – because if any of four of those people is approaching me, like, life has altered forever. That, I mean, I think it would be at that point. So I was yeah. you speaking about those. I was actually really surprised from, you know, going through the days of putting an interview together or like what I kind of wanted to explore, what I could find and then end up asking you. Listening to the music and then looking at your influences was not jarring, but it was kind of it was just different because your list of influences was along the lines of the people you just listened to. How have you found, I guess, like such a broad range of writing what you do for Myora and, but being influenced by, you know, like Dua Lipa, NF and and such? Yeah. So I guess the timeline of like when I was in Myora, when that started in 2018, um, there was definitely like lots of, lots of metal, lots of, lots of prog listening. And then I was in another pop band with similar members from my aura plus another um called midnight at seven and that kind of expanded the range to more to more pop to more soul and then after leaving both the bands all together um and starting producing like i'd say the only metal music i write now obviously since i haven't written anything from my aura since i left sure like maybe two years ago the only metal and rock music i do now is actually for gear companies because a lot of that mm. is tailored for good there's a lot of is tailored for guitarists so i still listen to a lot of metal um and that that strand of listening goes into those kind of songs i make for gear companies but the rest of my listening is for the rest of the stuff i do like at the moment i'm producing a 10 track um album for an uh an artist here in sydney i did the the ep and i'm doing their album now and that is all heavily Kanye inspired, very heavily, like the references I keep getting are like Kanye, sometimes Kendrick Lamar. Like that's a very different range to metal. Um, Working on, working on a few tracks for sync as well at the moment, you know, the influences for that are quite varied because you've got the orchestral elements too, where it's, you know, very trailer heavy, very trailerized. So I'm listening to a lot of, Ludwig, I'm listening to a lot of Hans, um, you know, those kind of stuff mixed in with rap music too. So, and then at the same time, I'm a part of a nine, tr- uh, eight track ambient album too with Jeff Slaw, a producer from Utah who I stayed with. And that kind of music, I'm, I'm listening to lots of ambient stuff, lots of chill stuff, um, lots of lo-fi stuff as well. Um, I mean, I feel like the best way to put it is I absorb as much as possible and then kind of shoot out those strands of listening when I need them. That's awesome. I think it's cool to be able to just be have those different interests and, yeah, be able to pull for those from those uh, in terms of writing and stuff. So 
in terms of, you know, you, we all have those friends or, or you hear people who say, I listen to everything. Would you say that you're really on the boat of like, I listen to everything? Or is there a genre that you still still just can't get your head around? Uh, probably, probably K-pop, country, oh. K-pop, country, and incredibly heavy, like EDM. Oh, so like, right. I still, I still listen to, I still listen to things like Skrillex and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I listen to, I guess you could consider Martin Garrix like pop EDM mm-hmm. as well as Avicii, like kind of some EDM elements too. Um, but incredibly like, like dubstep style, like drill, that kind of, that kind of listening just genuinely hurts my ears. And I'm not saying like, because it's bad, there's a very specific reason yeah. for that kind of music. And like, I can appreciate everyone who makes it because I reckon I could not do it like for sure. Um, but it's just like, yeah, it just, it's just not for me. No, I get that for sure. And I, you know, every, I think everybody has genres like that, even if we have an appreciation for, for things, you are someone who's worked with a lot of people and you've been to, you know, you've been to NAM multiple times, having networked with quite a few people, whether it be reaching out to people or going to these events which of these would you say, or which element would you say has been the most important to where you are today? Only, like, I feel like, see, I feel like when I network with people, I really become on, on, on some level, like slightly more than a peer. I try to, I try to get to know people outside of, of just music because you know, right. I can know them a little bit more outside of music then I can actually see whether we're going to get along or not. Yeah. Like I, I don't like the ways I've gotten to physical events is just because I have been in, you know, good relationships that started professionally that, you know, turned into just being, you know, Oh yeah. Like that's Neshi. It's like, I know him. Sure. Like you want that kind of like, you want to achieve that level of like casual, casual knowing. I feel like just not being a pain. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I, I harass the hell out of people to get what I want. Like, and I am not afraid to step on toes or afraid to be told no, but like, there's, there's a, there's a good balance. Just, just not being, just not being like awful to work with, awful to be around. I mean, I know some people that like are a bit much or their egos are flying everywhere, but the, when, you know, when everything comes down to it, they are actually good to work with. And I think that's, that's the bottom line of everything. And be willing to learn and listen. That's a good attitude. I like to learn and listen. You know, be be approachable, be understandable. And you mentioned earlier, communicate. Uh, anything that's like about communication and understanding, uh, but in terms of pieces of advice and stuff. Have do you consider yourself someone who's easy to work with? I would assume the answer is yes, with like what you just mentioned. But has talking to people or interacting with people is that something you've had to develop, or is that pretty easy for you? No, I think I've had to do, I've had to learn how to learn other people's work methods Hmm. because like when I'm on my own, I have a very specific methodology about how I do things. Like I have my list, I work through my thing, like, and I work a lot to get through stuff. I don't mind if I don't take breaks. I've had to learn that other people work different ways. And that's not something that I've just had. That's a very much learned skill. Um, even, Even for this album I'm producing at the moment, I'd say at the beginning it started off slower than what it is now because I've had to adapt the way we um we kind of go through the feedback process just on the way that the artist is like for example he he really likes listening to things so it means <laughs> that I'm starting to like in the sense of he'll take things away and listen to them over and over again so I've started bouncing things out earlier to allow him to have more time to change rather than us like going through a lot in one go and him having like a lot of things he wants to revert back to. Oh, right. So I think like, I think I am easy to work with, but I will become easier to work with as I work with more people and learn more approaches. Cause as you know, as you go on, you start to see patterns and different types of people and different types of attitudes towards getting something done. So I think I'm easier than I was to work with and I will be easier going forward. That's great. Uh, you know, 
growth is always important and we want to be a part of that and stuff. Uh, nobody really likes to talk about their shortcomings, especially when it comes to music and stuff. What do you feel like is something that you're working on that you just don't feel is quite there yet, whether it relates to music or it's kind of the things surrounding music? Um, I think one thing I am working on right now is actually bringing emotion more so at the forefront of composition. Okay. I think that is one thing I'm really trying to like understand. Like I'm, I'm not a huge, hugely emotive person in my day to day life. So Mm -hmm. trying to push that through into the creative sphere is something I'm definitely is forefront and present lyrics, having more intentional lyrics is something like not lyrics that just sound good at a melodic level, but actually if you were to read them and be like, okay, this, this is cool. Um, and I think my continuous vocal drum, just dr- drum and vocal development, like vocals from a performance point of view and a recording point of view, drums from a writing point of view. That's good. Do you find that you, how do I want to phrase this? I guess the thing I probably should have asked from the beginning is what's the whole deal with writing music for you is like, do you, are you writing for people? I mean, not obviously for them, but Um, is it as a point of expression or is it really just fun and like what's the whole deal for me it's just a lot of fun but I think like for me it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun to see them bring their ideas to life it's a lot of fun to be a part of cool projects like the Amity Affliction One like you know other bands that I've that I've done that aren't out yet um it's a it's a lot of fun but I think I am working on my own music that I think has got to be more expressive because I think it will become more relatable because of that. Okay. I think that's uh, great grounds to cover. Uh, I appreciate you sharing all that with us. Is there anything you want to promote right this second uh, that maybe is coming out pretty soon? Um, In the next few months, just keep an eye on my space. I've got an ambient album, which will be really good for study. Anyone that likes study music, it'll be really good featuring... um, Really awesome, like Norwegian film writer as well, Daniel Herkensdale. He's on a track. Um, yeah, so keep an eye on space. I'll be in in Nam, in LA again in April. So keep an eye. We'll see what kind of weird stuff I get up to there. It'll be good. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Nishi. I appreciate your time and uh, good luck to you. Best of luck to you moving forward and stuff. Thanks, man. This was awesome. Awesome. Thanks. We'll see you.